HBC Digest Radio, welcome back. I'm your host, Jared Carter. We are continuing our coverage of the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are uh, having specific emphasis on our dynamic leaders, faculty, staff, students, alumni who are playing a significant role in keeping black communities and campus communities protected and informed during this response period. There is no better guest to have on uh, than our distinguished leader today. He is Dr. James Hildreth, the president of the Meharry Medical College in Nashville, who has made headlines over weeks for his expertise and his forward thinking along with that of his faculty in trying to develop uh, medical solutions uh, and treatment options uh, with a particular emphasis on the African-American community during this pandemic. So doc, it it is an honor to have you on today, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. So today you announced that, or at least this week leading up to this, you've been talking about the the, the priority that the nation has to take in, 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 in protecting the lives of brothers and sisters, particularly those of us in African-American communities, uh, where we know that the statistics on our infection and death rate are higher and disparate in comparison to other ethnic groups. Uh, you have recently talked about Meharry's effort uh, to develop antiviral treatments um, for this. This is obviously a huge thing in breaking news. Can you talk about that process and what is happening uh, at Meharry uh, to help the nation and the world, in fact, uh, get to a better place with this pandemic? So we have a great uh, team of scientists at Meharry who are interested in infectious diseases. They've done work on HIV, of course, which is my field, on Zika, um, you know, uh, parasitic infections, trypanosomes. And so clearly, like the rest of the scientific world, we'd like to turn our expertise to try to find a solution uh, for this uh, horrible virus that's causing uh, wreaking such havoc in our communities. And so we're, we're doing two things, really. One, uh, myself and one of our other faculty members are working on antivirals. We're actually taking drugs that we were developing for HIV and another one for Zika, we are changing the composition slightly to make it targeted to um, the coronavirus. And we're going to be evaluating uh, those two compounds to see whether or not they have some value in, in uh, slowing down the virus or, or blocking infection by the virus. And I'm very excited about that. The other thing that we're doing is we set up an assessment center for COVID-19 uh, back in early March. We, we weren't able to launch it right away because we couldn't get supplies that we needed, but we launched it at the end of the month and we've now tested hundreds of, of people from our community. And I just feel it's very important that we do that because as you said, the virus when it infects members of our community, the outcomes are not as good as they are for other communities. I heard you on another interview talk about the, uh, and I guess the, the, I don't have the right terminology for it, but the infection rate for this is about a four. Meaning that for every one person, there's a possibility of spreading it to, to four people. Can you kind of explain that to folks who've never really gotten into the details about what this virus is and how it gets transmitted so quickly to different people? So in virology, we rate the infectiousness or contagiousness of viruses according to how many people an infected person could possibly transmit the virus to. A familiar virus is measles. It has an effective basic reproductive rate of 12 to 18. That means that every person who is infected by measles who does not have their virus controlled can infect somewhere between 12 and 18 people. The number for the coronavirus in this case is considerably lower, but it's still significant. Uh, depending on the area of the country you look in, it's going to be somewhere between two and five. And if we just say that that number is four, that means that every person infected with coronavirus could pass the virus on to uh, four other people. And that would mean, if you do the math, that means that, that a single person over the period of 60 days could be responsible for a million people getting infected. That's just how infectious this virus is. And that's how we get to the numbers that we have worldwide. Uh, for African for African Americans, there, there's such an emphasis, at least over the last two weeks, about the the disproportionate numbers that we're facing in infections and and death rate, and so much of that conversation has talked about you know these underlying health conditions, asthma, and cardio you know vascular issues and um, things with lung capacity. 
as a as a doctor, as a practitioner, and as an academician, do you look at that and say, "Hey, this is a this is a this is a hard fact," or do you look at it and say, "Well, there's more to the story than that." Uh, you know, there's another narrative beyond you know, you know, the one that well, kind of just leaks out. Black folks are just unhealthier than other people. Well, there are layers uh, to this, and I would start with the biology. Mm-hmm. The biology is that when a virus infects our bodies, the immune system is responsible for expelling it from our bodies. So if your immune system is not functioning at the highest level, you will not you know, get rid of the virus as quickly as someone who might. The other thing is viruses tend to damage the organs that they target. So for example, hepatitis virus causes liver damage and because it infects the liver. There are viruses that infect the heart that cause myocarditis they cause heart failure because they infect the heart and it fails. In this case, the coronavirus is targeting the lungs. And so if you have any condition whatsoever that compromises your lung function, you're not going to do as well as somebody who does not have that. So if you smoke, if you vape, if you have asthma, if you have any other condition that makes your lungs less than optimal, when you get infected by a coronavirus, we can predict that you're likely to have a poor outcome. And there are other things that fit that category, cardiovascular disease, asthma, diabetes, hypertension. Those are all things that either in combination of the immune system and our lungs, they cause uh, them not to function as highly. So this was highly predictable that in the African-American community, we were going to be hit much harder than other populations. Because as you know, for decades now, this is not a new thing. Right. There's been a disproportionate burden of those diseases in our communities. And a great example is the other pandemic that's still raging, which is HIV. Mm-hmm. We're, we're only 13% of the population, but 43% of all the HIV infections occur in African Americans. So this is not new. And the biology explains it. The social constructs that make us he- less healthy than others, they will have to be addressed. And I think that I'm hoping that one thing that will come out of this pandemic is that leaders in the appropriate settings will make the decision needed to change that. But for right now, uh, because of social determinants of health, we are less healthy and the virus is is, uh, racing through our communities and causing much more harm than it is in other communities. Let's go back a little bit because you raise an interesting point. One of the, the effective things that HBCUs in particular do is they build awareness in black communities about health maladies and treatment options and the importance of going to a doctor regularly, the importance of participating in trials. Can you kind of reflect on when you first heard about this this novel virus and when the moment kind of occurred for you like, man, this this is going to be serious and this is going to this is going to hurt or kill a lot of people. So in uh, January, when I started reading the reports coming out of China, and keep in mind that China is a very racially homogeneous place. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's not a lot, compared to other countries, of course, uh, genetic diversity in terms of racial attributes is much less in China than it would be elsewhere. But even in China, if you smoked, had heart disease, diabetes, or uh, high blood pressure, they they also observed that those individuals tend to die much more often and have severe disease. So if you extrapolate to the fact that this virus was definitely going to spread around the world, and unfortunately, the, we as a country got a late start because of you know because of the politics. And just be honest about that. Right, right. Uh, we had a late start, but knowing that they had observed that in China. And knowing that the virus is going to spread around the globe, you could extrapolate fairly quickly, and a lot of people did, including me, that this is going to be bad news for, for our communities. And unfortunately, that has turned out to be the case. What has been your reaction to the, the social distancing guidelines, um, our, at least at, at this point, our capacity to observe them and kind of slow down the spread, even though we're still in kind of a dangerous place? Have, have you been satisfied with those things? Do you think that we should be more aggressive? And what's your reaction to, the, I guess, the socioeconomic part of this, as, particularly as a practitioner? Because you got to look at this and say, yeah, we need we need jobs and money and all that, but people got to be alive <laughs> to have the jobs and the money. Well, 
Yeah, I mean that's that's the other thing is that layered on layered on top of the diseases or conditions that make us more prone to severe disease, we are not necessarily able to do the things that other people are doing or do them as well. For example, if you live in a multi generational household, mm -hmm. um, you may not be able to do the social distancing when you're in your home if someone happens to test positive for COVID-19, mm -hmm. which means that if you're living with an elderly grandparent or parent and you get positive and you can't move out of the house or have somewhere to go, there's a great probability that that virus will now spread to that whole family unit, right? Mm -hmm. So those social factors are contributing to a rapid, more rapid spread in some communities, i.e. some African-American communities, than would be the case in some white communities where, you know, the, the density in the house and the ability to socially isolate and keep distance in the house is, uh, is much better. So one of the things that I've been advocating for is that in our communities, we're going to need the capacity to provide lodging or a place to stay for some individuals for some short period of time so they don't have to go back to the household where there are elderly parents or grandparents. In other words, to keep those individuals protected, we have to provide accommodations for those who might test positive who otherwise will be going back into the family setting and infecting others. And that's one of the biggest concerns I have is that it's not as easy for some folks in our communities to do those things as it is in majority communities. And so that's just another factor that's adding to the challenge we have to deal with this virus compared to the majority population. When you think about the numbers of, of African Americans, uh, particularly in with this virus, do, do you think that even as large as they are, that that's accurate? Or could we be missing a sizable portion of people who, who never reported being sick, never reported to a hospital, maybe dying at home? Are you, are you afraid that there may be underrepresentation in those figures? Oh, I'm convinced that the numbers we have are not, not uh, accurate. And in fact, in New York, I just read or heard, they're going to reclassify some people who died in recent uh, weeks who almost certainly died of coronavirus infection. Um, and at the time, they didn't get tested or we didn't, we weren't fully appreciating what those symptoms might have represented. So they're actually going back and changing uh, some death records to reflect the fact that those individuals probably have COVID-19. And the other thing you point out, which is really, really important here, many individuals can be infected, have no awareness that they're infected, while at the same time transmitting the virus to those that they interact with. A great example that everybody probably knows is George Stephanopoulos, who's a journalist who works for ABC, I think, mm -hmm. who, who got the virus, was tested positive, and according to him, and there are many others like him, he never had symptoms that would have made him think he had a, a viral infection. Um, and so, and that may be related to the status of one's immune system, it might be related to the mode of infection that you have, but I'm convinced that the virus was circulating in the American uh, population, U.S. population, long before the full awareness of it was there. And I say that because the world has become a small place and people are traveling be between continents freely now. And I'm, I'm reasonably sure that one of the major airports that was connected to China uh, San Francisco, New York, Miami, whatever it might be, that we've had the virus in this country for a few months, mm -hmm. much longer than I thought. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the work that you and, and your team are doing with the development of these antiviral treatments. What kind of support have you gotten from state, federal agencies in funding or knowledge-based transfer? What does what that behind the scenes look like for institutions like Meharry that are at the forefront of kind of help helping to develop solutions for this? Well, because we have very limited resources, but I think like other organizations, we've decided to invest some of those limited resources in this because it's so important. So what we're doing is we're trying to get preliminary evidence or preliminary data to show that there is a something something worth pursuing here. 
And at that point, we're only a couple of weeks away from having that. Mm -hmm. Then we are going to uh, submit proposals to try to get uh, some additional funding uh, for this. You know, drug development is a very expensive undertaking. And you want to make sure that you have some good, solid uh, evidence that what you're pursuing might actually be something worthwhile. Uh, and so we're in that stage now, and it's, it's looking promising based on the, the science that's already been done. Mm-hmm. So we're in the process now of confirming in kind of uh, test, tube, test tube experiments that this uh, compound can target coronaviruses. And once we have that preliminary data, we can move on to the next step. Um, and we are collaborating with, I'm collaborating with some scientists in Brazil for example, uh, and I know that's happening all over the world, that that people are collaborating globally, trying to accelerate the discovery process. And for me as a scientist, that's very exciting to know that that's happening. And then we finish up with uh, what I hope is not an easier question, but certainly one of note that a lot of uh, folks, particularly in your seat, you know, are considering. You're a little unique in that you're your student body and your, your community is comprised of, of graduate students, medical school students. Um, but when you look at the future of, I guess, the industry of higher education and what happens with international students and stu- student recruitment, what happens with people coming to campus, what happens with researchers coming to campus, are you concerned that the industry will change so much because of what we have to do just to stay safe and alive? Um, that Meharry or other HBCUs may look really, really different in the near and distant future in terms of what a campus looks like and and how it operates? Well, I think one thing is that the pandemic accelerated a process that was already underway, and that is converting a lot of our teaching to uh, flipped, we call it a flipped classroom, whereby the students are learning in their own spaces through technology. Uh, you know, a lot of our professors have uh, committed their lectures to a video uh, where the students can watch it when they when they want to or need to, and then the uh, the face to face time, which is really by Zoom or through technology, is now about discussion. So, to, and what to one degree, the the pandi- pandemic just accelerated a process that most universities had already undertaken to uh, change how we teach is a little bit more complicated when students have to be in a clinic interacting with patients to learn their craft. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we've had to bring back all of our students who are in clinical rotations for safety reasons, but also to free up PPE for the doctors and frontline folks. So we are, like all the other medical schools, trying to figure out how to make sure our students can have uh, acquired the skills they need to, to finish their medical training and go on to their residency. But I do think that uh, when we get back to normal, it's not going to be the old normal. It's going to be a new normal. The virus is going to be with us until we find a vaccine, probably for 18 months to two years. And so I would say that during that time, we're all going to have to find ways to keep ourselves protected in our communities. So folks need to know it's not going to be going back to normal. We're not going to flip a switch and be finding ourselves sitting in a crowded theater with hundreds of people and more for a while. Uh, And I think in terms of education and teaching, a lot of it's going to remain in the flipped classroom kind of modality. Uh, But there are some things where you have to be in somebody's space. And a good example of that is our dental students. Our dental clinics are virtually shut down because by their very nature what dentists do create aerosols Mm -hmm. and aerosols of course are one of the ways that this virus is transmitted Mm -hmm. so so from our perspective that the influence or the impact has been pretty profound especially for our our dentists our dental faculty and our dental students uh but we're adjusting uh, you know we're we're learning from other uh, medical schools other dental schools um and that's been exciting as well to share best practices so we can all get through this together but you're absolutely right. Things are going to be different. Uh, we're not going to go back to the old normal. We're going to be going back to a new normal, which is a combination of things we used to do, but some new things we have to do just to keep each other protected. So I think that's going to last probably for 18 months or so. 